My seagoing career ended in 1982. I mean, back at sea this ship, it's almost like coming home after being away a long time, you know. You just wonder what's happened, and it's very encouraging to see that some things haven't changed, but it's very encouraging to see that lots of things have changed for the better, fortunately. I went to sea at 16 in 1942, and I joined the ship on the Clyde a couple of months after leaving his school. We set off in convoy into a howling westerly gale. I was as sick as a dog and we spent three weeks beating our way across New York. But I was never sick a day after that. It cured me once and for all. The Anglo-Persian Oil Company was formed in 1908, following one of the world's greatest oil discoveries in the southern deserts of Iran. Within a few short years, the company had run out of money to develop its products and lacked the means to transport its prize to market. A resolution came by way of the British government. War was looming and the country needed a dependable source of oil to support its fleet. Persuaded by the Royal Navy, led by Winston Churchill, the government invested heavily in the business and in doing so took a major shareholding. The injection of capital spurred the company into action and on April 30, 1915, Anglo-Persian shipping arm the British Tanker Company was formed. Well, in the early years, proper tankers as we know them now didn't exist. They were very much adapted cargo ships carrying cased oil. That was where BP Tanker Company started. I mean, in the early years, they were talking about super tankers of 30,000 tons. Well, we think of super tankers these days of 300,000 tons. In BP's case, we were having to take oil out of the Gulf. We had to have very small ships. We had to have shallow draft ships. So the ships stayed small until the waterways became dredged and allowed bigger ships to go in. The carriage of oil presented the ship owner and the ship builder with a, a lot of challenges. They assumed originally that there would be ship owners willing to take up this exciting new cargo. And few of the tramp owners wanted to invest in a new type of ship. So they found that they basically had to do it themselves. Well, here I've got the drawing for the British Emperor, 3,000 tonner built on the Tyne in 1916. It's the first purpose-built ship for BP. We have a forecastle with the crew's quarters forward. We've got the bridge deck with the navigating officers and captain, and aft we've got the engineers. The ships are quite fine, they're long and narrow, straight stemmed, they've been pitching pretty heavily, low freeboard, so the waves have been washing over the deck. And when these ships are at sea, especially for the crew right up forward, it had been a pretty tough life. The first ship I sailed in was an old ship, British Commodore, built in 1921. When the crew went on watch, if it was bad weather, the seas breaking over the decks, they took their life in their hands going on and off. And when it was meal times. The deck boy would go to the poop and fetch the meals, and when, by the time he got back to the folks, it would all be cold. It was it, <laughs> primitive, is, is probably the right word to use for the conditions. Within two decades, the British Tanker Company created a major new fleet of almost a hundred vessels. Britain's shipyards were put to work, and the vision of Anglo Persian as an integrated oil company was realised, as its shipping arm began to move large quantities of crude and oil products from Iran to the UK. There were new, rapidly expanding markets for oil as road transport, aviation and the plastics industry grew. However, the World Depression in the 1930s served to slow the growth of the oil age.
Although the Western economies suffered from the depression following the Wall Street crash, there was still a pretty steady need for oil fuel. The building of new tankers sustained a lot of shipyards through the very bleak days, and BP was particularly good at keeping a number of yards operating and keeping men employed. But this fragile new stability would soon be shattered as the world edged closer to conflict once more. In any time of international tension, merchant shipping was usually required to support the armed services. You could not have individual ships traversing, particularly the North Atlantic, on their own because the German U-boats could pick them off. So the objective was to put 40, 50, 60 ships into a convoy, which could be defended as a single unit by a number of naval escorts. Oil tankers were a prized target and by the end of the war, 657 of the tanker company's seafarers would lose their lives, and 260 would be taken prisoner of war. I remember the very first convoy I was in. We were attacked by a submarine. It was about three o'clock in the morning, the second officer was on watch, and he saw two torpedoes go by. The tanker company lost something like 50 ships. Some of the ships were lost with all the crew on board. There was the Empire Gem. I think she was lost with all hands except the master. I knew two of them on board that ship. Third officer. Third officer. Yeah. Gosh, look at that. Um, third engineer. Uh, first third engineer. It reminds me of the people who were less fortunate than me, who were attacked more vigorously, and a lot didn't survive. I was one of the fortunate ones. Well, after the Second World War, a big fleet rebuilding program went on. That's when the major changes occurred in the structure. Because they were growing so quickly, new techniques were needed to design them. So a lot of input was required from BP then to get the shipbuilders to produce the ships that they really wanted. The enlargement of tankers was accelerated enormously by the Suez Crisis and therefore tanker owners decided to build larger and larger ships which transited the Cape route. The new ships were not only larger, reaching over 100,000 tonnes, but those now entering service were well designed and technologically advanced, and the spacious new living quarters meant life at sea was changing dramatically. As conditions improved, it opened the way for spouses to join their partners on overseas voyages. For some, it would provide the setting for the first months of married life. Before she could come away to sea with me in those days, you were required to have your first or second class engineer certificate. Went and passed my examination, which enabled Linda to sail with me. Well, we got married in August and the following month um, we went off to sea. Next thing I was on the British Sovereign, just me, no other women, and um, with about, what, 30? About 36 men. <laughs> <laughs> you were literally an island floating around on the ocean, and you were self-contained in every way, and you had to make your own entertainment because it was limited, in fact, extremely limited communication with the outside world. We played cards a lot. We played table tennis. Uh, I was the ladies' champion on the British Sovereign. And <laughs> and we had so many fancy dress parties and it's amazing what people turned up in, you know, how you ma made outfits out of what was available. I mean, what was available? Like lampshades come Lamp to mind. Lampshades and <laughs> bandages. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we had some really good parties. Yeah. 
better not talk about them too much. <laughs> yeah. Of course, Gary was working, so you know we weren't together all day or anything. There was always a photograph of Linda at the, I don't know, in Greece or whatever, and I wasn't there. Yeah. Whoever was going ashore, if Gary was working, I went ashore with whoever was going ashore. Every opportunity, yeah. So you've seen the world, I haven't seen anything. <laughs> you saw the engine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The post-war world seemed started to look seriously at the environment and the protection of the environment. By this time, tankers are huge, uh, and therefore they focused an awful lot of attention on the carriage of oil. Then two tragic events. The explosion of the British Crown and the grounding of the Torrey Canyon brought matters of safety to a head. Well, the Torrey Canyon impacted on BP because although it wasn't BP's ship, it was BP's cargo. The industry became very, very much involved in trying to deal with the consequences of pollution. But of course, the, the real issue is how do you prevent it in the first instance? Inert Gas Systems, IGS, came about following several really bad incidents off the coast of Africa on other companies' ships. The reasons behind those losses were a number of factors. One is that the tanks are carrying a mixture of air and hydrocarbon vapours. Secondly, any spark that occurs in that tank can produce a huge explosion. And an inert gas was a way of getting rid of air in the tanks and hydrocarbons in the tanks and placing inert gas there instead. And rather than BP hold the patents for it, it gave it away to the whole industry to use so that everybody else could benefit straight away. The development of inert gas what was perhaps the most significant safety improvement that took place in 30 or 40 years after World War II. I mean, it was a, a really major development. Until the 1960s and 70s, shipping had been an entirely male-dominated profession, and it would take a determined person to break through the ranks. When I was about eight, we moved to Pimlico to a house that is right across the river from Bassey Power Station. It's the view of the river that I remember so strongly from you know, being here in my bedroom upstairs. And in those days, we're talking about the 1960s, there were still ships up and down the river bringing coal to the power stations. I just loved everything to do with ships, um, and I could see them every day. I think when I was in my early teens, and I started to think that I would really like to go to sea, but I didn't know how it would be possible. You know, there were literally advertisements that said, it's a man's life in today's modern navy, that kind of thing. And I was very lucky that um, a chap at the Port of London Shipping Federation office down in the docks took an interest in me and clearly thought that I might have what it took. And BP were the ones that took the chance and gave me the opportunity, and I was glad to take it. Well, here's the journal, Nina. All right. I haven't seen this for a little while. I would say my journal uh, is a record of what life was like for a cadet in the Merchant Navy in the 1970s and to some extent what it was like for a woman as a cadet in oil tankers at that time. And then here's you. Here's me in my here's uniform. Here's you in your uniform. Young women today are much more mature at the same age than I was. I think they have a much better understanding of what it is to be a young woman, even if you're in a male-dominated field. They understand that anything is possible if that's what you want to do. Um, and they take that for granted, um, which is how it should be. These for women in shipping that I've seen, I have know of two chief mates with BP that a female I sailed with a female in almost every ship I've sailed on in um, officer ranks. Uh, they seem to be going up the promotional chain quite quickly. I hope to sail with a female captain in a few years, possibly. Possibly be a female captain myself. Any vessels coming up on the AIS? Can I bring the speed up a little bit? Yeah. Joining a company that, that wants to move forward, I think, is fantastic. 
I cannot wait to start doing the career that I've trained to do and being with BP I feel that I've got great opportunities that lie ahead and I'm just looking forward to get going. Being 21 and having charge of millions of pounds worth of investment is exciting. I'm looking forward to, to getting out there and being a part of it. The 70s had begun in a spirit of optimism. The world had an abundance of oil and BP shipping, like most of the world's tanker companies, had massively expanded its fleet to carry it. The greatest fun for me uh, was the period in the early 70s. We were on the crest of the wave, running efficient ships and with a marvellous relationship with our seafarers. 1973 was the big change. The cutbacks in the oil supply and the hike in the oil price from three, five dollars up to maybe ten dollars. I mean, we talk about ten dollars now, but ten dollars seemed to us to be the end of the world in those days. And of course, it had a considerable effect on the demand for oil. The sudden turmoil caught the world by surprise. Oil prices soared, consumption slumped, and the Western world plunged into recession. Many of the countries where BP had made major oil discoveries took the opportunity to nationalise their oil resources. Its effect on BP, who had built its entire business on access to vast reserves of Middle Eastern oil, was profound. Now BP shipping found itself with a huge excess of vessels in a market where charter rates had collapsed and where competitors sailing under flags of convenience were operated to lower costs and in some cases lower standards. Or BP Shipping Board went away in 1975 and discussed the nature of the problem and the actions to be taken. With ships, it was obvious. There were straight economic considerations. Some ships were unsuitable for the new situation. They were burning too much fuel. They were older ships. We had to get rid of, of some, and they were the most suitable. So we got rid of those. When it came to personnel, this was rather more difficult and to have to make staff redundant, uh, the highest quality staff that you can have, that was very upsetting. BP shipping remained a high cost operation and in 1986 the decision was made to hand over all seagoing staff to Agency Manning, ending the direct employment of nearly 1,700 officers and ratings. In the midst of the crises, large new discoveries of oil by BP in Alaska and the North Sea offered a new ray of hope. The tanker company's skills would now be needed in the challenging new frontier of offshore exploration and production, and its naval architects began overseeing the construction of a range of innovative new vessels. Specialist ships were required for the North Sea, which hadn't really been developed before, and the most notable one of is, is, is the SV Air. The realisation was that a fire engine was required to deal with fires on platforms. That vessel could do lots of other tasks at the same time. So a diving system was fitted in there. There was um, hospital facilities. There were maintenance facilities. It was pushing the boundaries of new concepts and it was really quite radical. New frontiers and the influx of flags of convenience brought with them new risks. When the Exxon Valdez spilled oil along the pristine Alaskan coastline, the shipping industry was to begin a series of changes to how oil tankers are designed and operated. For BP shipping, safety was brought into sharp focus in June 1993, when the British Trent was struck by the Western Winner in heavy fog and caught fire resulting in the loss of nine of its officers and crew, and the injury of many more. As the crew of the Western Winner was quietly flown out of the country, the lack of a satisfactory investigation compounded the sense of injustice. It was a sharp reminder that regardless of flagging out, the company had a vital role to play in raising safety standards across the industry. Despite this tragedy, the 90s represented a more positive period in the company's history. 
After successfully riding the waves of world recession and major downsizing, the tide now began to turn for BP shipping. BP shipping had reached a fairly low ebb. The size of the fleet had dwindled. Uh, there had been no new additions to the fleet for many, many years. And I feel that was a point at which we could have gone either way. What started the turnaround for BP? Certainly the company that I found, there was a repository of some of the highest integrity, highest quality individuals any shipping company could possibly ask for. So the problem wasn't the people. The problem were the assets. And therefore, the decision was taken to build new ships for the first time for years. And these were state-of-the-art ships. The first ships to be built were three Suez Max class tankers, double-hulled, the very latest technologies, and actually was, I think, the first glimmering of a dawn of revival. And it really went from there. This was the start of a major renaissance for BP shipping, and cadet recruitment and direct employment of officers started again. A series of mergers propelled BP into the ranks of the oil and gas supermajors, and BP shipping had to adapt once more. I think one of the underlying business changes for BP shipping over the last 20, 30 years is to move as part of a, a supply organization to a trading organization, with you know, business going anywhere in the world with all sorts of products. It's required a different approach. We have a more commercial outlook on where we trade our ships, how we structure our fleet, how we go about our business. As a consequence, a huge $3 billion program of shipbuilding was begun. And at its peak, BP was launching one ship every month. A fleet of liquefied natural gas carriers was also developed, featuring industry-leading designs. In just a few years, BP shipping had been transformed in size and scale, and now its role providing marine expertise to the group also began to develop. In 2005, this expertise was called upon when the Thunder Horse platform was found to be listing in the Gulf of Mexico. The vessel didn't have any air conditioning or ventilation going, uh, and if you can imagine in August in the Gulf of Mexico, it was very, very hot. I had a boiler suit on, crawling around in, in the bilges, effectively, of this uh, Thunder Horse semi-submersible. I managed to find out what had gone wrong. There had been some errors in the construction of the vessel. When you think about being at sea, the oil that we're going to find tomorrow uh, is going to be in more and more uh, inaccessible places. A lot of it is going to be uh, under the sea, and a lot of it is going to be in very, very deep water. If something goes wrong, you can't just pick up the phone and, and call a service engineer. You, you've got to solve the problem yourself. There's an awful lot of marine activity uh, that goes on that is extremely important to the success of the business. Marine skills, therefore, are something that the BP group needs, uh, and it needs quite a lot of. As the fleet continued to grow, the number of staff pushed towards 2,000. Eleven offices now supported the fleet and the myriad of activities that make up a major international shipping company. Our role is exponentially growing in the wider parts of the group. Today we have over 100 secondes in other parts of BP, bringing that general and maritime skill to bear on other tasks. Uh, and we're ever greatly more appreciated by the whole organisation for what we can bring. So as we were rejuvenating BP shipping, we decided we needed to articulate the values of the corporation in the best way we could. Uh, and we eventually alighted on a strap line of raising the flag together with three core values of clean seas, safe ships and commercial success. So I would characterise BP Shipping today as the newest old company in the world. This company is rich in tradition, rich in history, has built on an activity set that broadly hasn't changed for a hundred years. Our principal job is transportation of oil from A to B safely and securely. We're doing that now in the 21st century with very modern ships, with very modern people, with very modern ideas, and therefore you know, based for you know, a future 40 or 50 years going forward with the equipment we've got, and any corporation doing that will be a great organisation uh, and will continue for the next 100 years.
at the moment, of course, we're on this very fine 100,000 ton tank, or a very modern one, and it's a but very considerable change from what I was used to when I first went to sea, of course. It's very impressive because it incorporates a lot of the features, like the double hull and so on, which I could see when I retired in 1983 were going to happen. But, but actually to see one now in the flesh, as it were, operating the way I'd imagined it would, I find it extremely interesting. The jump to modern digital technology has been a huge leap. I was very surprised to see you've got seven cylinders there. Very small. Very small, but very powerful engine. The engine room is unmanned from five in the evening to seven the next morning. Everything is controlled automatically. People know exactly how much cargo is in the tanks, the rate it's coming in, the quality of the inert gas. It's all there in the control room at your fingertips. We've got two radars. Everything controls from here. The navigational systems on board, of course, are totally different from what I experienced when I was at sea. I mean, I got tremendous pleasure out of astro-navigation and finding the ship's position. Even a really competent man who, who knew his job would do well to get a positional accuracy better than one or two miles. I mean, these days with GPS, of course, you're talking of one or two meters. I mean, it's a totally different thing from that point of view. A seaman of my era would find it very difficult to run this ship. And, and the ship's position is superimposed on that? Yes. It got inputs from the GPS, AIS and everything. And they all agree? They do. I'm very impressed. The fleet's extremely modern, very well designed, excellent ships, very, very good personnel. And of course we're nowhere near the end of it yet. And you know, the next generation of ships is going to be significantly different from this one, I'm sure. I think the thing that makes BP shipping uh, unique is the quality of the organisation, the quality of the staff and the quality of the ships. I think I've had a really good cadet ship. I think I've had some of the best training that could have been available. They gave me a chance when nobody else would. The integrity and also the safety culture and the professionalism I, I think is second to none. But when you're talking to your peers from other shipping companies, you can sort of mix with them, knowing jolly well you belong to an organisation which is as good or better than any of theirs. Wherever you've, you've been, you, you know, you, you have a certain amount of respect, shall we say. What could be better than, than being 100 years old and knowing you've still probably got another 100 years in you? Whatever the challenges are in the future, whatever you know, the environment will throw at us, business will throw at us, the people inside BP Shipping will be able to cope. I'm absolutely sure of that.